All right, welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green, bringing you brand new interviews right here on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe and uh, go down into the link, click on the Patreon link, and then uh, sign up for that. You can ask the questions of the guests, like my guest today. Uh, you probably know him best from Izzy Stradlin and the Juju Hounds, also the band Broken Homes, and, uh, and Buck Cherry as well. Uh, Jimmy Ashurst is here. We're going to talk about a whole bunch of things. He's got some amazing stories right after this. All right, please welcome Jimmy Ashurst. Hey, hey, how's it going, Jason? Jimmy, I'm excited to have you here. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I watched a couple interviews with you. Uh, and some of the questions were so painful, so I'm going to try not to do that to you. Thank you so much, man. Thanks for sparing me the uh, the agony. Sometimes I can see the agony in your face uh, uh, talking about uh, things that maybe seem silly. But uh, I want to go back. You were born in Italy, right? Um, yeah, I was. Uh, I'm an American person, a dependent of the, my father, who's in the United States military, U.S. Army. But he um, served as a sort of a NATO capacity. So I was I grew up on NATO bases, um, a couple of which were in Italy. So uh, I um, I mean, it was a it was a gift, you know, um, to be able to grow up in an environment like that. But, um, you know, I was raised and went to schools, the schools we, I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of guys like me around the world, like right now. Um, uh, I've run into a lot of uh, occasions where people don't seem to comprehend that fact here. Um, and um, thought it was some kind of a, an immigrant, but these are uh, Department of Defense run schools. You know, um, when an officer serves overseas there, you know, they bring their family and all of that stuff. It's happening as we speak. So, uh, but I'm really grateful for that opportunity. Uh, I sort of, uh, as I said, there were American schools full of American people, kids, but, uh, my family lived in, uh, in the city. So, um, after school, you know, I mean, during school, I was speaking, English with all my American friends. And then after school, I'd be running around in the streets with the Italian fellas in the neighborhood. And I sort of absorbed it, you know? So um, that was really cool. And it, ser it served me well throughout my life. Um, sort of tends to um, allow you a little bit of a, a global perspective, which sort of comes in handy in uh, the work that I chose, you know, um, so uh, I, I, I find myself revisiting that um, quite often. Yeah, I think that comes up a little bit in your career as we go further, because uh, sometimes people in America don't think much outside of America. You know, we think we're everything and that's it. But because you were uh, born in a different uh, country and and you're a dual citizen, uh, I think it uh, it shows that maybe some bands have different ideas. We're, we're going to get to that. Uh, your mother uh, is a, was Italian, though, right? I'm sorry? Your mother was an Italian uh, citizen, right? Yes, yes, she was. Um, her entire family goes back to uh, um, generations in uh, in the city of Naples. Um, originally, they were the Sardinelli family, but um, it's uh, it was quite a... Um, a the circumstances that... Um, precipitated that was basically began with World War II. And so, you know, um, the Allies sort of entered Italy from the south after the um, North African campaign and moved up with the British and uh, sort of took over um, Naples at one point. And um, so it was part of the army deal with back then that um, they would facilitate you know, if, a, if an army soldier were, was to meet uh, an Italian girl or what have you, um, and uh, they would facilitate citizenship uh, immediately. So by the time I was born, it was many years after that. Um, however, my um, 
I wish I was a dual citizen, but my mom um, had relinquished her Italian citizenship. Well, so I was born to two American citizens, um, which, you know, at this point, uh, it was sure the dual, dual citizenship would really come in handy, but I, I'll get it eventually. I just have to, I have to struggle a little bit, you know, in order to, to get that. Um, but I am, uh, I do intend to try. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't. Can't say I blame you. Um, you might have a little bit of feedback. Is is there is your hand on the mic or something? Um, I'm not sure what's going on with the audio, man. Honestly, it's yeah. just a bizarro world. I'm in a vortex of um, updates and whatnot, mm -hmm. um, and things. So, uh, is this better? I'm just speaking directly into the thing now. I think it's okay. We still have a little bit of static, but let's see what we can do. Okay. Um, so you uh, so you moved to and when you're high school age, you moved to the United States, right? That's uh, true. Yeah, um, I was uh, plucked out of um, sort of the senior, my senior year of uh, of high school around 16, I suppose, and dropped off. Uh, my family moved to suburban Los Angeles. Uh, so it was a little town called Cerritos down by Long Beach. And at the time, it was a bit of a developing sort of area. It's, it's not anything like it is now. It was still sort of cow pastures and very flat. And uh, where I lived in Italy was, you know, really metropolitan it was like a manhattan -y type of thing but on a beautiful bay and so um it was quite a culture shock and uh, i wasn't really prepared for that and so it wasn't until i um i felt really uh sort of um you know alien and, uh, and uh you know the people around me didn't really didn't really help with that much so um I think the pivotal moment for me was when I got my, finally got my driver's license. I was able to drive around and uh, come up to um, to here, basically to Hollywood, and uh, at, and it was at a really uh, um, fortuitous uh, moment in Los Angeles history. Uh, everything was sort of exploding um, here musically now. At that point, I didn't really consider playing. I didn't play an instrument or um, I didn't, you know, I didn't know much about it. But when um, I, I recall when I was in, uh, when I was still in Italy before we moved here, I saw some things on the television, on the news, and they were talking about some big movement, some big um, hubbub happening in London. And what they were talking about was the earliest punk rock movements of the late 70s and so um you know and you'd see the bbc bright and people seemed horrified mm -hmm. by um you know what was occurring up there and so i don't know some that that struck a chord with me i, I was you know i felt like i kind of wanted to wanted to check that out you know <laughs> so, so um you know i eventually did uh in fact um I believe it was 1981 when um, I still wasn't too comfortable here. So I, I kept going back every opportunity I had. Um, so during the summers when I wasn't in school, I would go back. And it, um, I think it was 1981, the summer of 1981, I went back and I decided I, I just needed to be there in London um, to sort of investigate what was going on and that precipitated a whole trip i hitchhiked from naples italy to london that took about a month and a half um and then i arrived there's another long story in there as well but um you know i was a huge fan by that time i was a fan of uh you know that entire world over there so i mean the clash and the damned and um uh, Stiff Little Fingers was another band that I was really into. And, you know, that had been exploding over there. I felt by 81, I was already late. But um, as it happened, I um, sort of was wandering around London. And uh, as I said, it's a long story, but I, um, I was sort of saved by uh, the drummer of the damn 
were at Scabies, and he took me in and allowed me to stay with him. And so I was, you know, able to figure out how I was going to get home. And, uh, and during that time, they were recording uh, the album Strawberries. And um, so I found myself in a lot of the studios. Most notably, it was Pete Townsend's studio um, on the Thames River, Yilpai Island. And so I was kind of in there, you know, and I learned my way around the studio, or what not to do pretty quickly with those guys. You know, you don't walk through a closed door when someone's tracking, or you might get a little of this in the back of the neck, you know. And, um, and you know, just the sense of humor. And I just felt like um, that's sort of where I belonged. And so I, um, that's where I really decided to... Uh, with that spirit that was going on um, there of uh, everyone sort of, I mean, it, it, it became about the songs to them and less about knowing how to play. And so I was encouraged. I thought, you know, in order to become a musician, you had to study since you were, you know, a little kid, but um, they, they were very encouraging and uh, thought it'd be a good thing for me to try. So I, so I did. <laughs> did you start with the bass? I did. Uh, in fact, it was at Rat's house. And, um, you know, there were a lot of instruments. He had a lot of instruments hanging on the wall. And I, I, he just said, pick one and uh, play it, you know, learn how to play it. So, I mean, I just picked the one with the fewest strings. Sorry. Right. <laughs> it looked easy. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So, well, that's a pretty incre incredible beginning and, and sort of shows the beginning of your punk rock roots because throughout your life, there's going to be a lot of, uh, uh, of these sort of punk characters for sure. Um, so, okay. So you, your, your family, like you said, you go to California. Now you're around other people and other musicians. Um, from what I heard, there was a band that had a gig at the Roxy and you just wanted to play the Roxy and this would be Broken Homes. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, um, I joined after my um, that trip to London. I came back, and things were sort of exploding here. Um, it was a very different um, atmosphere. I, but I mean, I, I um, you know, I, I sort of it sort of all happened very quickly, and uh, I was asked to you know sit in with several bands, and and I think within six months. Uh, Broken Homes guy, and they, um, they, they brought him in without question. There was no like auditioning or anything. We just formed a band, and that was it. And um, but, but at that time, things were really percolating. I often reflect on that uh, time because I, I realized that uh, there's a set of circumstances that can that will enable a scene to occur, and um, in a certain city at a certain time. And um, fortunately, that's, um, you know, I don't think we'll be able to replicate that ever again because the ingredients for that you know, are no longer are here. Like, um, you know, just like in Manhattan or in London, you have to have a combination of uh, affordable rents so that the artist types can um, move to the town and afford to live there. And also mm -hmm. you have to have um, a couple of individuals, uh, you know, it's the the constant, the age-old uh, correlation of um, art and commerce, you know, so that you have to have an entrepreneurial guy who's got a club where you can play. And right. so we had all of those things. And, and when I say an entrepreneur, I, I, I mean like a sort of an individual or a family-run club, not a corporate, not a live nation-owned place. Uh, you know, these were, we had... Um, you know, we had them in the hundreds here in L.A. There was, you know, Madame Wong's East and West, the music machine. Uh, God, I could, you know, I could go on and on and Orange County. And so it, they, they were, you know, it was a combination of all the artists who had, you know, moved here, which, you know, required some courage uh, and um, and risk. And then, uh, also the, the venues in which, you know, to play. And then the sort of people started to show up and um, 
you know, after that, basically, you you know, yeah. you could do a game. We're having some audio issues. Let me have you try, come come in and come out, and we'll edit this out. Okay. I think it'll help. Do you want me to? Yes, yeah, so you just have to log out and then just come back in, and I'll cut this out of the video. Uh, because we get we get this. Like, uh, Is that better? Let me hear you. Well, now you're frozen. Uh, uh, Definitely try to come back in. You there? Uh, yeah, really don't get it at all. I mean, I'm trying everything over here. Headphones, oh, no, no, headphones. Your phone. I'm holding the phone. <laughs> the holding the phone might be yeah, what's now causing you're it. Too, so, right. I really, I mean, I don't know because my place is a fucking construction zone. So I really don't want to show too much of where I am. Well, no, I so that. I really don't want to move around too much. Huh? No, I understand that, yeah. What's that? I, I yeah. understand. I'm saying maybe log in and log back in. Like, okay. You want me to log out? Yeah, log and then just come back. Try it again. Yeah. Let's see what happens here. any better right. yeah gotcha all right, all right cool definitely better okay so i'll cut that um so you play that show at the roxy with broken homes right were they already a band i mean like do they have the name and everything i think they had been a band very briefly um for a matter of a couple of months um craig uh ross lived in the valley so he's in a suburban sort of a vibe. I think he started at started the band at Cal State Northridge, but um, you know, very soon uh, they um, they uh, got me found me playing on the Santa Monica Pier, and um, so they um, had already, already had some management and whatnot, which um, I didn't know much about. I just <laughs> I wanted to play the Roxy, but. Mm -hmm. um, that's sort of uh, how that came about. And um, and uh, uh, we just kind of went from there. We, um, there weren't, at that time, there weren't many bands um, who had, uh, uh, were signed to a major record label. I think from what I understand, um, the one before us was Van Halen. So we were at the very sort of cusp of, um, of the, um, the sign what would become a signing boom of uh los angeles bands but there was a you know there was quite a uh, a series of of shows we did prior to uh to getting signed and after getting signed i mean we were still um very active on the los angeles sort of club circuit and um and then after we did uh 
the first record we started touring, I would say more nationally and um, ended up on several major well, some tours. Pretty, and some, that. Pretty amazing, some pretty amazing tours. Stevie Ray Vaughan, Joan Jett, In Excess, Jerry Lee Lewis, I find that to be an interesting one, uh, Georgia Satellites, and there was others. These are some pretty amazing bills. Yeah, they were fantastic, man. And I think, um, you know, from that, we learned uh, sort of how to, you know, the ins and outs of actually touring and how to, um, you know, especially from the Georgia Satellites, man, those guys, if you've seen any of those shows in the clubs, they could, uh, I mean, they would, they would start, you know, they could, they could deal with a hostile crowd, like better than anything I'd ever seen, probably since even, and they'd have them all dancing on the bar by the end of the, of the show, you know, um, that's a, that takes a lot of skill and, um, and patience, you know, so we learned a lot of those traits from our guys. And of course, that's where I began uh, my association with, um, with Mr. Rick Richards and that sort of uh bore some fruit later on as well yeah. you know so it's a, and it continues uh today <laughs> you guys are both in the juju hands and you guys are still friends to this day as you mentioned yeah. so you've told this story before but I, I, it's one of my favorites i'm a giant fan of the dead boys i grew up on the new york punk scene you had played with stiff baiters you had known stiff baiters obviously the story that I want to hear, and you know where I'm going, is you're playing with the Georgia Satellites at the Roxy again. Yeah. And Div Baders tells you that he wants to come to the show. I'll let you take it from there. He wanted to come to the show. And, um, of course, and at the, I mean, of course, he tells me that at the last minute, meaning that he also wanted me to pick him up to go to the show. Which, you know, L.A. is a big place, man. So it's like, you know, that sort of adds, uh, you know, another 45 minutes to the itinerary. But, um, yeah, and I got I went to the hotel. He was staying at this Holiday Inn up here and on Franklin. I guess it's gone now. Is that it's where the Lowe's written. is now? What's that? Is that where that Lowe's is right next to the Chinese Theater? Yeah, basically. Yeah, exactly. I mean, now it's the mall. Back then it was... Uh, it was on Franklin and uh, in Highland, I believe, the yeah. Holiday Inn, and um, he was had a room up on the nineteenth floor in there, man. And uh, you know, we would uh, he and I had been known to sort of you know miss a few nights sleep here and there, and um, so I kind of knew what to expect and was hoping to corral him and his uh, and his girl Caroline out of there as um, expeditiously as possible. That did not prove to be the case. We were in there forever and he was, you know, looking for his stuff or whatever. But as we were leaving, we passed a couple of guys and um, basically they, they, they held us up um, guns and the whole thing. And they, they sort of uh, rerouted us back into the room, which was, um, that was probably the most worrisome part. I figured we were all right as long as we were in the hallway. But, you know, we went back in the room and Steve and I were down on the ground with one of the guys on our backs. You know, he had one knee in my back and one knee in Steve's back. And the other guy was rifle in the room and all of that. But, um, uh, you know, they got what they came for, I suppose. They missed a ton of stuff. These guys were dumb as shit. That I, you know, he had, still had all this money, like thousands of French francs, and they just left. They didn't know what it was, so oh, um, so they didn't know what to do with that. But as they were leaving, they said, "Okay, everyone, you guys got to count to three hundred or something, because we got a guy at the end of the hall. You know, it's gonna blast you if you come out and don't call anybody." And they, you know, all of that jazz. And so as they left, it was like dead silence in there for a while. And Steve and I was, I was still, you know, laying side by side on the floor. We didn't get up. And so finally I figured at one point, I'm like, Jesus Christ, I'm so late for this gig, you know? Um, and, uh, and I turned to Steve and I go, Hey, Steve, we got to go, man. There's nobody at the end of the hall. We just got to get up and go. And Steve was laying on the carpet and I hear him like he'd passed out like dead asleep. <laughs> Only in an armed robbery could Steve Bader's fall asleep. Yeah, yeah. 
it was crazy too because once we arrived, I mean, my band was so pissed off at me because you know I was literally like they were calling me to. I ran through the crowd and jumped on the stage, and um, and they, you know, and I'm like, dude, you know, I got. And afterwards, they're like, "What the fuck were you?" And I'm standing there with Stiv, and I'm like, "We got mugged, you know." And they're looking at the both of us like, "No fucking way!" <laughs> I mean, to this day, I don't think they really believe me. <laughs> I, I've heard a lot of uh, Stiv stories. It's one of my all-time uh, favorites. That uh, yeah, that, that he, <laughs> he would uh, react like that. And those records that you played on with Stiv are incredible. And for people watching who aren't familiar with. Dead Boys or Lords of the New Church or Stip Bader's solo music. There's a, a world of entertainment out there. So I want to make sure people know that because Stip wasn't really a household name. But if you knew, uh, you knew. So another thing with Broken Homes that you probably don't consider to be the biggest moment. I know you don't, but I bet you a lot of people would be excited to hear about uh, uh, this. Let's see. Let's bring this up here. <laughs> uh, this is a little movie called Back to the Future. <laughs> and that person in the zebra pants is Jimmy Ashurst. And uh, so um, you were signed to MCA, Broken Homes, three records on MCA, and uh, MCA Universal are together. And so this is a Universal movie. And somehow they convince you guys to come out and be a, you know, extras, essentially. It's a very small part. This is the scene in the movie where Michael J. Fox's band, The Pinheads, are auditioning for the school talent show. Huey Lewis uh, is, is the, uh, the principal or whatever. He's got the megaphone. And uh, he tells them they're too loud. But before Michael J. Fox can walk on the stage, he has to walk past you guys. Uh, so I've heard you talk about this moment in cinematic history. And uh, so you tell me a, a brief bit about it. Yeah, we didn't know it was cinematic history, man. <laughs> we had no idea. Basically, uh, just brief. I mean, this is Los Angeles. You know, you can walk out of the house at any time and wind up in a in a movie. But uh, we happened. The fact that we were on uh, on MCA, um, I think uh, you know they were uh, also with uh, you know as a Universal subsidiary or. I'm not sure what the arrangement was back then, but basically if there was a film being made by Universal, they would go, they would look to MCA for any artist because, you know, it was cheap. They didn't really have to pay us. And so uh, we were on the same, <laughs> it was on the same label. So we didn't know anything about um, who was in this thing or that it was going to become this uh, classic film for, for generations, you know, we, we had no clue. And people often ask me, you know, what was Michael J. Fox? Like, I, I didn't know who he was. I didn't know. We didn't know who any of these people were really. And they just said, go stand over there for a while. And we stood there for a while and then we left. And that was sort of the end of it. <laughs> it's yeah. like, it's a bit, bit of an anticlimax, but you know, what have you. No, but it's, it's, it's funny because, You've said that you didn't even realize that that was Huey Lewis until later. No, I had no idea. I had no idea. And I didn't really know much about Huey Lewis even. You know, I wasn't, we, we weren't really listening to the radio. I knew he had big hits that were everywhere, but it wasn't really something that we would have, uh, you know, responded to in any way. It was just sort of uh, the environment at the time. I, I didn't recognize him until like hours later. Somebody said, that's Huey Lewis. <laughs> I'm like, okay, cool. Um, uh, it, uh, you know, it's one of those things, um, that sort of occur here. Well, that sometime. began your movie career because we can't forget Thelma and Louise, another legendary movie. Uh, you did that one too. Was it a similar story? Which one? Thelma and Louise. It was a similar story. Yes. Uh, although that one was a little bit more involved because, um, Ridley Scott, uh, the director, I did know about him, and he actually physically came down to see us play before um, he, uh, and this was a band, this wasn't purely the Broken Homes, this was uh, a band, he, he, he wanted Craig and I to be in a band um, on the stage with Charlie Sexton, who was another MCA artist at the time. 
And so it was sort of a manufactured band and we got Charlie Quintana to play drums. And um, so again, there's another, you know, association that will endures beyond that, uh, that event. But um, we, and uh, our singer in the Broken Homes wasn't initially included until he sort of pitched a fit about it. And he wound up in the film anyway. And he, he wound up with a, with a, with a bigger part than than we did, he ended up dancing with uh, Susan Sarandon, I believe, in the um, in that cowboy bar scene. But in the background, that's us playing, you know. Yeah, it's 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 pretty funny, and it is like you said when you're on a record label and you're in Los Angeles, um, these kind of things uh, present themselves. But they're fun uh, side notes to your music career. So Broken Homes, like we were saying, three records on MCA. Um, there's videos and things. Sadly, that debut album is kind of considered a lost album. I know that in the Universal Fires, um, the masters were destroyed. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, from what I understand, uh, so they they tell us. Actually, they didn't tell us anything. We had to you know, start digging around, and they're like, oh, yeah, well, bad news, boys. <laughs> you know? So um, I guess that's it. Uh, the only thing we could, you know, ostensibly do, but there's really not a lot of demand for it. Um, you know, we could uh, uh, remaster from a pristine vinyl if one of those exists in the world anywhere. But, um, you know, what would be nice is for the band to be available on uh, streaming services or something like that, mm -hmm. which Universal should have done well prior to burning up our masters. They could have, um, I mean, at the, I think around the, the turn of the century, um, they digitized everything and they just simply neglected to digitize ours. Wow. So uh, that's sort of where that stands at the moment. Um, we'd like for it to be available, but you know, it seems like a hell of a lot of work and a lot of money down the drain. You know, back then albums cost, you know, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to make. So um, you'd think they'd wanna, they'd wanna find it, right? Yeah, and <laughs> when people are discovering these bands all the time and music that people missed out on and sometimes music is so bad right now we got to go back to find the good stuff that we missed the first time um, yeah. yeah but so at towards the end of broken homes lenny kravitz uh, comes to see you guys and uh what does he do well he uh he arrived at a um at a very uh on a on the perfect night because we were basically pretty disheartened after um, being sort of shuffled around for six years and three albums worth and tours and all of that. Um, having said that, though, uh, you know, there was a regime change, um, several regime changes in MCA records uh, with the personnel that was working with us. So those people went off to uh, different jobs. And so we were sort of languishing there. We didn't really have anyone who um, was really familiar with us at all. So having said that, though, I mean, six years was a pretty good long run where they did continue to pump a, a lot of money into us for a, the span of three records. So that was um, pretty rare and, and extremely rare now. I mean, it just oh, simply yeah. doesn't happen. So we were given, um, or the albums were, I wouldn't say given a fair shot because um, basically no one was really working them after the second one, I believe. But, uh, you know, we did stay there for a while. So that was, uh, that was cool, I guess. But Lenny showed up and, uh, you know, Craig, I think at that time was looking for an opportunity or an opportunity presented itself like basically right in front of him so um i was uh very happy to see that and i was glad for him to um to jump at that yeah and he's still there uh to this day uh, yeah he is. yeah um the other two gentlemen broken homes have both passed away now is that right that's correct the drummer lost the drummer the original drummer craig aronson who um 
uh, actually went on to be a very successful A and R man at um, a record company himself, and mm -hmm. signed a lot of bands. I can't remember who exactly he, but he had a very successful career doing that. And uh, so, um, and Michael Doman passed, um, I believe, a year ago, a little over a year ago, uh, and that came as a bit of a surprise. Yeah, well, I can only imagine, uh, especially, you know, in your career, I mean, in anyone's career, but people start to pass. Charlie Quintana, uh, you know, as we'll get to, uh, who's been in and out of your life so many times, also passed, uh, you know, much too young uh, as well. So this is the things you never get, you never get used to. It's a struggle, man. Uh, you don't ever get used to it. You just sort of become... Uh numb at a certain point but it does encourage you to uh sort of uh, uh nourish the relationships that you do have you know and maybe uh look up some people that you haven't spoken to in a while um at this point i find that that to be true in fact i seem to be doing a lot of that lately yeah, well, I think these last few years, just in general, do that. You you give us a good segue, though, uh, people that you haven't spoken to in quite some time. Uh, uh, I think most people are familiar with Izzy Stralin uh, and the Juju Hounds. Um, I think a lot of people are. I wouldn't know about most people. But <laughs> <they're>, <laughs> Maybe I feel it wrong. <laughs> yes. I think most people who are watching my show... Uh, are familiar uh you know but guns and roses did play with broken homes quite a bit they actually opened for you guys a couple times and so you had known the guys you were friends you were friends with izzy i was friends mostly with izzy i was acquainted with everyone else and um you know it was always fun when we found ourselves in the same room together um i actually was uh was in um london for their first shows uh in 85 I believe I'd gone there with Stiv, um, and I found myself on the street again in London, and um, uh, I just saw that they were playing, uh, you know, in the the local the Time Out magazine, and so I figured, you know, maybe I could weasel in there somehow and uh, find a bed for the night, and so uh, I, that's how I wound up at the Marquee, and they indeed did take me in, and I stayed with them for three weeks. At um, They were staying at a place, uh, a beautiful apartment building called the Allen House off of Kensington High Street, and um, I think Izzy and Axel were upstairs, and then um, in the other apartment was me and Del James, and uh, Todd Crew, I think, um, from Jet Boy, I know he was there. Um, and uh, he subsequently died days after that. Yeah, uh, I remember it being very close. He went to New York with those guys, and that's where the he next died. day, yeah. And Slash was calling me to meet him in New York after we had separated in London, and I just didn't have the um, energy for it and probably turned out to be so may have saved my life um but yeah so it was it was us in there and duff and i believe uh and steven were down in the other apartment and um uh, but yeah izzy and i would you know sort of always um i was sort of we gravitated together and um and especially during that trip and um and also prior to that and then after that as well uh there were some pretty notable moments in my life that um, he facilitated, really. He would take me along, like when they uh, opened for the Stones um, at the Coliseum, and then they were invited to uh, do the, um, the play the Atlantic City show, uh, uh, to sit in with the Stones. And Izzy invited me along to to go with him so it was just he and i and axel and uh and alan niven and uh we all flew together and uh, that was quite a quite a thing i mean that was a good three or four days i think and um several stones shows unforgettable time because i mean it was basically 
watching the stones from on the stage. Yeah, it, it, it pretty, pretty amazing um, to be part of those things. Broken Homes comes to an end. You're watching uh, MTV. You hear Kurt Loder, I believe, give the news that Izzy Stralin is leaving Guns N' Roses. Uh, and tell me what happens next. Well, he uh, he called me and then, um, you know, asked me what I was up to. Like in that moment, the phone rang. And so uh, it's like, what are you doing? I said, nothing, man. I'm watching you, uh, you know, on television. And uh, he said, uh, well, no, what are you doing musically? And and I said, you know, nothing. And uh, he goes, I'll be at your house in 48 hours. And so he drove uh, from Lafayette indiana straight here on his um on his harley and um showed up at my door and basically and was like you know we need to i want to do a record i guess we need a band mm-hmm. so you know start calling some guys and uh i did he uh he told you he wanted somebody like rick richards from the georgia satellites right <laughs> Yeah, he did. And uh, luckily I had a line on someone almost exactly like Rick Richards. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it all came into uh, play when you actually got Rick Richards um, to be part we of We did. And, and Charlie. And uh, although there was, we floundered a little bit um, in the very early stage, before those two came along, we had tried... Um, we tried a little bit um, with another friend of mine, and then uh, and um, for a while, Stan Lynch from Tom Petty's band was down there playing drums with us. And uh, unfortunately, that all went into the toilet when uh, the um, the L.A. riots had broken out. So we were down. We we didn't want to be in Hollywood, or Izzy didn't really want to be in Hollywood at all. So we were down by like Redondo Beach and we found this weird um, studio down there. It wasn't weird. It was just not, you know, it, it was it was a normal studio, but uh, it was on uh, Hawthorne Boulevard. And so, you know, sh- shit started popping off and people were shooting guns and whatnot. And um, so we told, told the engineer, you know, because we were tracking on headphones and um, we told the engineer to uh, let us know if anything went crazy. And um, sure enough, we were in the middle of a song and he's like, Shh, you know, automatic weapons fire, uh, you know, Hawthorne Boulevard and Torrance, I think it was, which was blocks away. So we kind of looked at each other and Izzy just said, and Izzy just said, you know, look, grab the tapes, we'll get the guitars and we gotta go. And I turned to where Stan Lynch was behind the drum kit and Famously to this day, I can still see the headphones were just floating in midair and he had just shot out of the back door or the side door of the studio and was gone. And I've never seen him or spoken to him since. (laughs) (laughs) That's uh, yeah, that's one of those rock and roll moments. uh, uh, (laughs) While the riots happened. Yeah, he's gone. Um, So you guys moved to do you go to Chicago next? We decamped to Chicago. Yeah, we had to get out of here. And so we had um, the tapes and we continued over there and we had the band together, um, you know, and uh, and so uh, we got, we were all sort of, you know, shacked up in Chicago for a while and um, and rehearsed also, I believe. We wanted, we were gonna start maybe doing some shows. I believe our first show ever was in Chicago if I rec- if I recall correctly but at some point Izzy and I mixed the record after Chicago in Copenhagen Denmark we flew to Denmark and um stayed there for quite some time um so when we we mixed it there but a lot of the photos and promo stuff we did um while in Chicago yeah. videos now- as well yeah was Izzy doing a lot of this on his own dime? Yeah, that's why we were able to make it. <laughs> yeah. We we wouldn't have been able to make that record uh, under any other circumstances. Um, and also, that's why we kept moving. Uh, we would uh, the minute they found out where we were, being the 
record company guys, we would, um, we'd bounce. It sounds, sounds appropriate. Um, <laughs> so this record comes out and there's obviously fanfare to see it's on Geffen, just like Guns N' Roses and there's interest. And I've heard you say, and I, I agree. I was, uh, I remember getting this record, and I think people were marketing it towards sort of the heavy metal or hair band uh, genre when this record is not that type of record. Right, and that's a failure um, that has continued, uh, seems to be consistent, you know. Um, uh, it's hard to describe. It's been a, you know, there's really... There's, they don't know what to do with a rock and roll band. Um, you know, they just have that heart America's sort of hard rock obsession with um, sort of, you know, head banging style music. They don't really know what to do with anything that isn't. Uh, the Georgia Satellites were very lucky in uh, being able to break that sort of ceiling. There were several other bands later. Uh, the Black Crows had to do it with a cover song. Before that, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, you know, they um, had to be rebranded as like New Wave, you know, in order to figure out what format they were going to play them, what radio stations were going to play them and things. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if you're in that area, it's, uh, it's quite a struggle and it really shouldn't be, I don't think. Yeah, I think that in time, I think some of those people who may have uh, dismissed this record because it wasn't a Guns N' Roses record have learned to appreciate it for listening to a, it on its own. It's not meant to be the Guns N' Roses uh, companion. It's a, it's a great rock record um, uh, on its own. And so, uh, and you wrote, uh, co-wrote with Izzy the singles from this record, a Shuffle It All was the video on MTV at the time. I did, yeah. What is the writing process like with him? Uh, look, um, it's one of these deals where like, you know, I didn't really know, uh, we, is he wanted to make a record is what he told me. No, there was no mention of songs really. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, a lot of that stuff came together in the studio in the moment. Um, you know, there would be ideas and they would be fleshed out. There were maybe like three or four that he had um, arranged, an arrangement of sorts. But um, most of that stuff occurred in the studio. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, going in the studio for a day or two. This, you know, this was like we're going in the studio for like six months and we're going to stay there until it's done. So, um you know, when you keep doing it at a certain point, songs tend to fall out, you know, and you get the right guys together. But the, that's the key is getting the right guys together. And if you were to replace any one of those guys, that record would have sounded entirely different, which is, um, you know, brings me to another topic, really, of that seems to be the the, I mean, back then, man, I don't know that I knew anyone who was a session musician. I didn't know anyone who would go in and, I mean, there, Hollywood was full of them, of course. The Wrecking Crew going back uh, generations, are, you know, famously the best musicians in the world. And there were a lot of those guys, but no one young like us, you know, we were all in bands. And um, I've always been a band guy to the bone. I don't um, I really... I can't grasp the concept of being in a band and not being able to um, become invested in the band emotionally. And you, um, you, uh, it's a, it's a big gamble, but you throw yourself into it. And then you're, you're, you know, you have a say about the aesthetics of the band, of the artwork, you know, all of that stuff and the, the general vibe and all those things. And all of us, did have that input and um and so that's what i became accustomed to and i think maybe that is um has hurt me in the more modern age uh of um things where people tend to 
dismiss a person or replace a person on a whim. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but I think in a more organic sense, you know, uh, I mean, I think that's OK to do if you're going out and playing the same songs over again. But if you're in the creative process of doing that, I think um, it's it severely affects uh, the outcome when when that begins to happen. I feel like you might be referring to a band that you play with that doesn't have any original members uh, anymore, except for one. <laughs> no way. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that because I, yeah, say again? Coincidence, coincidence yeah. yeah. We'll get to that too, because I got to ask you this question. We're talking about session musicians. Well, I wouldn't call this person a session musician, but on the uh, Juju Hounds record, Ron Wood, uh, the, the legendary Ronnie Wood. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, he's it. not a session. I don't know that he does a whole lot of them. Um, he, I don't think uh, he has to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, he, you would play with Ian McLoggin, who's a legend uh, from the Faces and, uh, and uh, Small Faces. And uh, so you guys had known Ron Wood. You convinced him to play on the Juju Hounds record. He's uh, at his hotel. You guys are going to pick him up to come record his session. Tell me what happens. Well, yeah, I mean, he had back. He was in town. I knew he was in town. He was at the, um, was at the. I don't think it was a record plant. I think he was down at, uh, shit, A and M. I think he was in A and M Studios, um, doing uh, his album Slide on This, I believe. So we knew he was around, and so um, he had sat in with, um, with uh, Max Band, uh, in McLagan, and uh, again, that was. You know, that was sort of Craig Ross and I. And then later, when Craig got busy, um, we got Mark Ford in on that. And uh, we did, you know, a ton of shows. Um, and drummer Nick Vincent was um, was in that version of uh, Ian McLagan's Bump Band. And Ronnie would come and um, and sit in it a number of times. And, um, and we would play Faces songs. Uh, so, um, yeah, I had that association with him and so we we just basically you know uh uh asked him if he felt like doing it and i think he, he tentatively said yeah and he would come down to the studio i find later that um he was just going to come down initially to check it out and he wanted to you know it was important to him he was sort of wanted to check out the vibe of the place and then once he got comfortable he was like yeah okay i can, I can hang out here for a little while <laughs> and uh and uh, so we, uh, Izzy wanted to do um, a, you know, a, a specific song. He wanted to do "Take a Look at the Guy" um, off of uh, Ronnie's solo album. So um, one of the, I don't know if it was on "Give Me Some Neck," may have been, or I got my own album to do. Maybe I'm not sure which one of those. I think it's that one. I think that was the one. Yeah, I right, right, right. And um, so uh, we went to pick him up, you know, and. Um, yeah, it's, he seemed surprised to see us, you know, at, at four in the afternoon. Uh, we were supposed to be there at the studio at six or something. And he was, you know, had just dropped in a, I've just put in a film, you know, and he, he was very excited about watching this movie. And uh, at one point I asked him, well, what's the movie? And he said, it's Spartacus, you know, which is famously like a four hour long movie. Mm -hmm. Oh man! But you know, we patiently waited for that to to uh, to end. And then, so was it know. was it you and Izzy? What's that? Was it you and Izzy? Yeah, we were just sitting there watching the goddamn movie, man. I mean, I can't, I can't. To this day, I can't sit through that movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How amazing! You know, people do things at different times. Ron Wood uh, uh, it, it can do that, uh, but. And then after Spartacus, he was ready to go rock, right? Yeah, after that, he was good. You know, he was golden. And so um, I, I drove him down there and, uh, and uh, you know, which was wild because this was a little studio sort of way out. And, uh, you know, as I said before, in Redondo Beach. So it took us an hour and a half to get there even. But once we got going, it went into the, into the wee hours of the morning. And Mac was down there. The, the guy who played on the on the original version of it and um so we just blazed through that a couple of a couple of times live and a lot of people 
um, found that I guess Izzy's and Ronnie's voices were very similar and they couldn't really distinguish. A lot of people don't know that um, each verse is one of them. They trade verses. So it starts off with um, uh, Izzy and then it'll be Ronnie on the next line of the verse. So they're just trading lines back and forth, which is, um, you know, it's fantastic. Um, you know, I think uh, I read one funny review of it when someone's, you know, claimed that, uh, oh, no, it's, you know, they, they did it all wrong. You know, the keyboard part was all wrong. And the guy was, whoever they got to play it was playing it too fast or out of time. Mm. I'm like, it's, it's the actual guys, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It shows you uh, good critics what they, what they, what they know. Uh, you know the, the, <laughs> that it's the actual guy. I got to ask you, uh, well, well, let's continue with Juju Hounds just a little bit more because uh, it's only the one record. Uh, there was supposed to be a second record, right? We didn't know uh, what was going to happen with it at all. Um, but um, what did occur with us is we um, had started to just book some shows. We just wanted to go go and play after the first one was done. And I think we did the first show in Chicago as like a warm up. But then we basically booked an entire world tour. So we were everywhere else before we were in the States. Um, Izzy initially had reservations about playing the States at all uh, because of uh, what you alluded to earlier um, in that people sort of expected it to be a Guns N' Roses adjacent record, and it absolutely wasn't. And so we kind of had the feeling they weren't going to get it, and, uh, and they didn't. So we went to Europe uh, several times. We went to Japan. We went to Australia. And then... Uh, I guess at one point, some people, uh, business types, um, started to put on some pressure about uh, playing the states. And so in retaliation, I think, for that, they were going to make us do it. We played, uh, we booked the first show in Tijuana. <laughs> so that was, and that was maybe my favorite show. Uh, you know, they were all great. I had a blast, but Tijuana was just out of control, man. There's a place down there called Iguanas mm -hmm. back then. That place, I think it just probably just burned to the ground and down into the pits of hell uh, after that. But um, it was a hell of a place, man. <laughs> you should have been yeah, there. I, I, I mean, yeah, that's I, the only time I saw bodies falling from behind me onto the stage. You know, I, that had never occurred. You usually see him coming up from the front, you know, and uh, I was quite surprising to see him, you know, them coming down in front of me, man. Yeah, uh, it's pretty crazy. Did, was there pressure from the label or, or who, management to say you guys got to play some Guns N' Roses songs? Uh, we flatly refused. Refused actually, you know, Izzy flatly refused to do it. So there was, um, I mean, I'm sure they, they, they asked or suggested or what have you, but um, the, you know, we were in a very unique position of um, nobody could really pressure us too much because, I mean, uh, they didn't have it. They had they, they didn't invest any money in it. You know, we mm -hmm. we did it ourselves. Or he, Izzy, uh, facilitated that. Even the tour bus was his. So um, they didn't really have a, an argument. I mean, they could suggest, and they did. But, uh, nah, man, you know. Uh, yeah, he's was, gonna, uh, and he's going to. The second. Yeah, what yeah, would have become the second gonna... album with a different story? Uh, because um, that one they did uh, spend some money on, and so they. They wanted to, you know, stick their finger in the pie. <laughs> so you guys did go into a studio to record that second record. What's that? Did you go into a studio with the intention of recording a second record? 
Yeah, we went into several studios. We started at Wessex uh, Studios in London because uh, the illustrious Bill Price was working in Wessex, and that's where the, the Sex Pistols uh, recorded their record and The Clash. And so Ooh. it's a legendary um, studio with a legendary guy, and we love the sound of those records. And so we initially began there. And uh, we had some material together, and we were shit hot band um, from having traveled uh, far and wide and played a lot of shows. So we were really had it together. We could sort of read each other's minds. And um, so we stayed there for a while and uh, began again, not with a lot of material. We were just going to work it out and see what happened. And then uh, we um, at some point we decamped from there and uh, and we took Bill Price with us, and uh, we moved uh, the whole affair to the West Indies in uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Ooh. So we were down there in a beautiful studio um, called the Caribbean Sound Basin, and uh, we basically were living in there, you know, sort of above the actual recording room, and with Bill with us, and we would just sort of come downstairs and and play for a while and then go to the beach and eat shark sandwiches. <laughs> yeah, and we ended up, um, I think we had a good number of songs. I mean, they were in various stages of uh, completion. Most of them were basic tracks with a few guitar overdubs, but the, the essence of the songs were there. And um, that's when, uh, um, you know, some sort of, there was, there was some sort of turd in the pool uh, reared its head. And I think it became a little bit tired of uh, um, the, the business aspect of, um, of all of it, really. And he's one of those guys that um, you run into every once in a while that they can um, completely just flip a switch and it's, you know, over. And, you know, and and it's sort of uh, facilitated by the fact that he can just move to anywhere in the world on a on a second's notice and disconnect his phone. And that's the end of it. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, as uh, I did try, I think, several times to try to uh, track him down, I was successful in doing that, which he was not a fan of. Um, but uh, I just wanted well, what, happened, what happened? You know. uh, yeah, I just wanted to, some answers as to uh, I didn't know if the thing was, you know, if we'd broken up or what, what happened? I'd really had no answers. I mean, so I just wanted to know. And um, I didn't get many answers to that question either. So I just hung on for a while after that. Let's see if maybe, maybe he'd um, change his mind or, so you know, maybe he forgot. You know, who knows? But, yeah, well, this is this is what's so interesting about a guy. I mean, I've always been fascinated with people like, you know, J.D. Salinger, people who are a bit reclusive. Izzy Stradlin can walk away from the biggest band in the world and, and stay away. Not many people um, can do that. But so I, I heard a story. This, Kenny Aronoff told me the story that he was doing some shows with Izzy or something along those lines. And I think it was at Soundcheck that Izzy said he was going to uh, go surfing and he never came back. And that was the end of that. Right. That sounds right. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know, Kenny. That sounds that sounds uh, pretty accurate. Um, yeah, man, he's got the capacity to do that. I don't mind. I mean, I, of course, did mind um, for obvious reasons. But then but I think now um, I think he and I um quite a bit similar in many ways and uh you know at this point in my life i can absolutely walk away <laughs> tell that. Well, you've proven that but tell me how it ends uh did, did, obviously he doesn't tell you the band's broken up does he just disappear yeah it did it it, it just lingered man it lingered it's just sort of like you know floating in space um Obviously, I got the message after seven or eight years uh, of, um, of waiting. 
and turning down other opportunities. Uh, I, I didn't want to be in anybody else's band, really. And um, I still don't. Uh, so, um, but I, I had to let it go, you know, after, after a while. Although it did cause, uh, precipitated a really um, dangerous period for me. Um, well, you, you, know, went to, you went to prison at that point, right? I did, yeah. As a result yeah. of a very long and debilitating uh, addiction um, to heroin. Mm -hmm. So that uh, took me out of the game for about seven years. Um, and uh, unfortunately, ending me up in a, you know, a vortex of, uh, of uh, rehabs and incarceration and uh, all of that sort of stuff that I um, was lucky to have survived. Yeah, well, absolutely. Uh, most people in that situation probably um, uh, don't. Um, when is the actual last time that you even spoke to Izzy? Uh, I couldn't even tell you, man. Honestly, I don't think I've, uh, I haven't exchanged anything since, uh, or any communication with him since the internet. So the last time would have been on a, on a landline you know, at some point, I think the last time I saw him um, was when I uh, um, found that he was in back in Copenhagen and I flew to Copenhagen to talk with him. I think it's the last time I talked with him face to face, um, at which time he, you know, he didn't have any answers. He just kept saying, I don't know. I don't know, which, you know, I don't know to me sounds like there's a possibility, right? <laughs> so mm -hmm. so yeah. I kind of held on to that possibility for a long time. What's interesting is that Rick Richards is a mutual friend of you guys, obviously. You're still friendly with Rick, but Rick also still does things with Izzy, right? He does, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, um, I really don't... Uh, I mean, of course, I don't... I don't uh, I don't fault Rick for doing that whatsoever, but um, I really don't know uh, what 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 reasoning there is, and it's certainly um, you know what what I from what I've heard, I haven't uh, heard a lot. Um, it's a little painful for me to listen to, but um, it doesn't sound much like the Juju Hounds to me. So uh, I don't know that that was uh, he's ever been able to uh, manage to replicate, um, you know, bringing us back to my earlier point. And when you um, start, you know, replacing people, it uh, it changes the dynamics. So, yeah, you know, he I, did I, use I, I, I speak with Rick uh, often. And so, yeah. um, you know, uh, we're we're fine. Which is yeah, good. He, he, it's very good. He did use two of the Juju Hounds tracks on his record 117 Degrees um, uh, that you played on. I mean, so I'm assuming those two songs were left, uh, were meant for the second record, right? One of them I wrote. <laughs> did you get a writing credit? Yeah, that's the last, that's the last thing that I uh, listened to of his was that uh, record just to check if... Um, if uh, you know those were the actual songs left over from uh, the Trinidad sessions, and they were um, definitely, I I don't even remember the name. It was either uh, good enough or um, there was another one. It wasn't Memphis, so it would have been the one that wasn't Memphis, I suppose. If there's only two of them, right? Got to say, got to say, maybe. And, th and those are supposed to be the actual recordings that they're credited to the Juju Hounds. Yeah, they're credited to the Juju Hounds, but that doesn't do much for me. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I understand. Yeah, I, I, when I was lo looking at it and doing the research, absolutely. Um, I think people would have liked to see a Juju Hounds reunion. I know at one point there was some idea of you guys doing it without Izzy. I, I know that you said. You feel better that you did it. But I think people would have enjoyed seeing that band. 
uh, obviously with Charlie passing, that's not possible. No, it's not. But we did do it, actually. We toured with the, the Black Crows. Um, so I was hanging out with Chris at the time, and uh, the Jayhawks had been opening um, for them during, I suppose it was a leg of the Southern Harmony tour. But Chris called me from uh, somewhere in uh, Boston, maybe. And he said, you know, do you think you can um, get the Juju Hounds together and uh, and do this leg of the tour? He goes, you can ride with on my bus and uh, you can use our gear. So I called Charlie and Rick and uh, we did it. We didn't want to do it under the Juju Hounds. So we called it, uh, we were watching Ren and Stimpy or something. We called it the Magic Nose Goblins and we jumped up there and did it. And uh wow. And uh, that lasted for a good couple months, man. That was a blast. We weren't doing um, Juju Hound songs, though. We were just playing blues tunes and cover faces covers and shit like that. It was oh, a lot yeah. of fun, though. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea. You you are connected to the Black Crows because you played on their albums. You played mandolin. I don't even know where that comes from. H how did you learn to play the mandolin? I just, you know, I got a book called how to play the mandolin i think and started from there uh free it's google of, it's funny it's funny it's you know aesthetically funny to me because if you're carrying a like i have a giant like kind of a big doghouse size bass it's not a doghouse it's a guild acoustic bass in this giant case and then my mandolin case is like this big so you know you, it looks really funny walking through the airport but um, aside from that, uh, it's kind of the opposite of a bass. So it's the strings are, you know, it, it goes uh, the opposite. Instead of uh, E A D G, it's uh, G D A E. Which, uh, if you're in, you know, you get stuck for an idea for a song or something. Sometimes picking up an entirely different instrument with a different sound can spark a, an idea or a, or something can happen sometimes it doesn't but um you know that one is the most opposite to the bass that i could find so it's completely polar polar opposite <laughs> instrument but i also love the sound you know it's just a glorious little thing and they're loud as hell they're always amazing yeah it's uh but so you did play on those black crows records and it is a funny thing you know you're you're this uh rock bass player you know uh blues and punk and here you are uh, playing mandolin uh, with, with the crows. Um, here's a, so now we'll jump around into a few. Well, I've got to ask about Joe Strummer. I know Joe Strummer was a hero to you. You were fortunate to work with him. You guys recorded on the Gross uh, Point Blank soundtrack. Tell me how that relationship with Joe Strummer comes about. Uh, my friend Rat um, came back into the, my world. Um, he came to LA and um, for whatever reason, Joe had been... Uh, sort of sniffing around here and um, had had some associations with some folks, notably Rick Rubin and um, some other guys. And so Joe had been around and uh, Rat um, had been sort of joined his party of going out to um, events and, and things. And, uh, and so it was Rat who invited me. He said, hey, you might want to come down to the studio um, on, you know, the certain day, he didn't say anything about playing. And, um, so I, I did, of course, just to, um, be in the room with Joe, who I, by this time I had met a couple of times, um, at, in London at, um, because we were working with Bill Price. I remember I saw Joe at an urge overkill gig at, um, at the London garage. And uh, all these folks were there, Chrissy Hind and Pally Pal Paladin and like all these notable figures. And, the, and Paul Simona and the Clash guys were there. So Joe was there. And so I said, I mentioned to him that I've been working with Bill Price. And he got really animated and said, oh, I've got a message. You know, can you give it to him? And, and he wrote, you know, he had to find a pen and everything. And then he wrote down on a little scrap of paper. He goes, hey, Bill, microwaves are still bad. And, <laughs> and so I gave it to Bill Price the next day and he knew exactly what he was talking about. 
but I never forgot that little note, you know. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so I, I wound up, you know, this is years later, I wound up at the studio down here in, uh, on Santa Monica Boulevard and um, in there, and I'm just sort of minding my business. And uh, our friend Danny Saber was uh, running the, the recording desk. And uh, at one point, you know, Joe approached me and said, I, I heard you play some bass. And, and he goes, would you have a crack at this song? And so they put the song up and it was just he, it was just m me and Danny in the control room and Joe was out in the, um, in the large room. And I didn't think he was listening. And, um, but it turns out he was, and they ran the track and I just played one shot through and then he came in and he goes, can you come back tomorrow? I said, no, absolutely. So that started, you know, a good month or so of, um, you know, just hanging out down there as he was recording the uh, the the uh, the soundtrack for the film for Disney, which yeah, is kind of funny. To all parties concerned, it was hilarious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think you probably are the only person who has stories that involve rat scabies. Back to the Future, Disney movies, Stiff Bader <laughs> uh, being held up with you. You know. You you have a uh, you've got a a a, a very eclectic uh, uh, life. <laughs> yeah, so, it's hard to you know get it all together in one conversation. For sure, and that's why I'm jumping around just a little bit. But I got to ask you about this one. This is 2000. Uh, hold on, uh, you're walking by the Cat Club, which is not the Cat House, but the Cat Club. This is Slim Jim Phantoms place it's no longer there it's an irish bar now uh but you're walking by and what we're looking at in this picture is gilby clark who uh, uh i don't like to use the word replace but came in after izzy left and we're looking at axel rose and yourself tell, tell me what happened with this well i mean you know again this is one of these things that, 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 that i think you got your finger on the mic oh i'm sorry yeah um yeah. I think that photo was uh, published in Rolling Stone magazine. And so it became like a, a huge thing. And um, I, which I was not aware of at all. I, I, I um, literally was walking up the side. By, I mean, the, the whiskey's like, you know, 100 yards that way. So I was walking up this, my sidewalk going home. And... Um, and um, I was, I walked, you know, it takes me right past the, the whiskey and then the cat club, which is right next door. So as I was walking past there, a big uh, limousine pulled up to the curb and, um, you know, with a really pretty girl driving it, you know, which was a, a chauffeur, which was really, I thought was, you know, so I kind of stopped to look at that. <laughs> and, uh, and then I saw Axel get out and I hadn't seen him in probably... I mean, in years and years, man. I don't know. What year is that? 2000? 2000, yeah. Yeah, okay. I hadn't seen him in a while. And um, and so he saw me and he goes, hey, hey, you know, and I was like, hey, it's nice to see you, man. And he goes, can you, you know, come in here? I, I got to um, sit in and sing some songs. He goes, will you sing them with me? And I and I was like, I mean, I guess. I don't, I'm, I actually, I'm not really... I'm not a singer. And he's like, ah, you know, don't worry about it. It'd be fine. You know, you just sing, we're going to do, we're going to do like wild verses and something else. So, um, so I did, man. And that was it. And that night, I think I, uh, I went to jail. <laughs> I don't think I knew this part. <laughs> and, uh, a little bit later on. Uh, but, um, I remember, um, you know, somebody sent me that, photograph or a thing from Rolling Stones they uh, from a magazine they to me in, in LA County jail. <laughs> well, okay. So this is a this is an interesting night in Hollywood. Um you 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 and no one had seen Axel Rose in a long time at this point. This is one of the reasons it was such a newsworthy uh, story. So you just happen to be outside, you go in with Axel, you sing Wild Horses. I think he played uh, I used to love her as well. Also, this is the first time that he'd been around uh, probably Gilby or anyone Guns N' Roses related for some time. So tell me what happens after that night that lands you in jail. And your phone is sideways.
I think we might have lost him for a second. There you go. You're back. Can you hear me, Jimmy? He might have to log and come back. Can you hear me? I think he's going to have to log out and come back if you can hear me. Can you hear me? You can hear me, but I can't hear you. So somehow you muted yourself. Somehow you muted. Okay, he'll be back. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Okay. Sorry, um, man. No, no, no. All good. I'm glad you're you're here. Uh, uh, maybe turn your phone to the slide again. Like that. Perfect. Okay. Let's. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll pick up. So you you get on stage at the Cat Club. You sing with Axel and Gilby. Uh, at that point, Tracy Guns was no longer in that band. It would have been interesting to see that if they were. Uh, but so how do you end up in in jail? Um, I think they'd been uh, they'd been looking for me for a while, and they finally caught up to me, which is unfortunate because I wasn't really dressed for the occasion. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I think it was uh, they must have caught me uh, later on that night um, uh, on on my way on my way back home. But uh, yeah, so that's uh, quite a quite an eventful. Uh, chapter in my life that I'll go through in detail um, uh, in the future. Well, you may have a book in the works, right? I do. Um, it's long. I'm not in a hurry to do any of this stuff, man. I really i am kind of doing it on my own time. I'd like to do it. I'd like a change of atmosphere. So, um, you know, logical logic it's logical for me to go uh back to where i feel um my soul is sort of being nourished um over there in a lot of different ways i i enjoy the 
the uh, the culture and um, and a lot of other aspects of uh, living abroad. So I'm going to do that. And I think once I'm settled there, I will dig into um, the book and uh, possibly a record of some kind. Nice. Well, there's a little bit of a tease for people. Uh, you you got to wait for the book to find out why they were looking for him, why he ended up in jail, and while in jail, ends up in Rolling Stone all over the internet for that picture. Uh, <laughs> a little bit of bad time to hide anyway. I, I want to uh, touch a little bit on Buck Cherry. Uh, you were in the band Buck Cherry from 2005 to 2013. I feel like it's slightly out of character for you, but uh, uh, tell me a little bit about how you ended up with those guys. I um, <clears throat> it sort of uh, just came up. Um, I had uh, very freshly um, exited uh, the turmoil of um, the uh, uh, addiction and uh, subsequent um, encounters with law enforcement. So um, it hadn't been, I mean, it was almost simultaneous, uh, simultaneously that I, and I hadn't played or picked up a bass as I tend not to do when I'm not in a band. I haven't picked one up even now for uh, a year or two at least. And um, I just, you know, I'm either in a band or I'm not uh, historically. And when I'm not, I, you know, uh, don't, don't seem to do very well normally, but this, you know, now is an, ex an exception because I'm quite motivated to, uh, to, um, do a lot of things. Uh, but, uh, that occurred, um, when I did sort of pop up and I had begun playing a little bit with my dear friend, Mike Stinson, who is, um, just a wonderful guy and a wonderful, um, songwriter in the, the sort of uh, country vein. Um, and um, if you haven't heard his stuff, please look him up. Um, he's uh, just phenomenal. And uh, so, you know, if something inspires, if I see something that um, really inspires me to, to play, I, you know, I want to join it. So he invited me along to do that. And um, so we'd been playing a few gigs. And at one of these gigs, um, Keith Nelson showed up, who I did not know, and I did not know anything about uh, Buck Cherry um, as, uh, I guess, their first record started in 1999 or 2000, so I missed all of that. I didn't know much about it, but Keith was sort of very adamant about um, wanting to work with me, and um, I don't think he had the notion that the band was going to reform at that point, but it, it did uh, happen um, maybe a year or two after that. And uh, so I'd been recording a bit with Keith, and then he asked me if I um, wanted to, you know, basically join the band. And I asked him all the questions, you know. I said, um, you know, is it a band, first of all? And he said, yeah, assured me, yes, it is. And uh, and, you know, are we going to write the songs? Um, and he assured me that I could, you know, help write the songs. And so that was enough for me. I didn't have any expectations um, for that. I didn't know anything about um, what was going to happen. Um, I didn't realize that that album was going to go, I think, uh, it it maxed out at double platinum, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so then it was kind of off to the races. And uh, really quickly, man, like really quickly out of the gate, um, that song sort of took off. I think it was a coincidence of, um, you know, the Internet and social media has sort of begun to really uh, take hold. And, the song um, and then we had a... It's yeah, crazy, and there was some. There was some. Uh, I think people. It resonated with people. There was, you know, um, there was a song that was saying used foul language, and they could hear it. And we had a video with boobs in it, basically. So I think that, you know, kind of set yeah, the hook. You had two videos, <laughs> and you had, 
And you had quite the controversy. One of the videos, there was someone who claimed to be underage, and then they had to be edited out of the video. They used a fake ID, allegedly. So that there was two different versions of the video altogether. But yeah, that song is, a, is an anthem. I live here in Las Vegas. You can't go to a club or go out and not hear that or see a cover band. Uh, oh, uh, yeah? Bitch. Well, that's yeah, good to hear. That's nice to hear, man. I didn't know. I didn't particularly. That song came in very late in the process, and I was a little bit surprised by it. Um, it uh, was, ba I think, the last song that was brought in, and um, I wasn't really a big fan of it, to be honest. And uh, but then, you know, I figured, and then it just blew up. So I was like, well, what the fuck do I know, right? Right, sure. <laughs> Somebody liked it. It worked. Yeah. Can you hear me, Jimmy? Yeah, I guess. I guess you know. I just have... hold on. You froze up. Can you hear me? Uh oh. We lost your audio again. Can you hear me? <laughs> He's learned the uh, routine. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. you hear me? Man. Okay, I won't. Uh, I won't keep you too much longer. Um, so, so you're talking about Buck Cherry. You're talking about wanting to be part of a band. I find it funny that they told you uh, uh, come to rehearsal and bring your hundred dollar uh, share. <laughs> there were some red flags, you know, uh, right from the beginning. Um, I think out of uh, 30 years or so of my um, being in bands, I don't know that I'd ever been asked to sign a non-disclosure agreement, mm -hmm. which I did not, by the way, so we're good. <laughs> but um, yeah, I was going to say, but, uh, you know, I think that sort of uh, really um, uh, is a great descriptor of the, the atmosphere. I think times had changed, you know, by that time even. And um, it was a very uh, new crop of these very business oriented band guys, you know. Um, and I don't know that they knew anything different. Uh, so um, over time, um, that began to wear me out. And uh, I could see that, um, uh, as it ha so often happens, you know, a lot of money started coming in and, um, and that's, uh, sometimes causes some problems. Um, and so I, you know, uh, I, I was aware of some grave mistakes that were being made in in my view uh um in favor of um basically you know money so some bad decisions were um being made uh with that sort of predicate and so um and i felt like it was it was damaging the band and it was damaging to the to the fans and things. At one point, I thought it was too big to fail. I mean, we were doing uh, arena tours, headlining arenas, and so I was I was hoping that that was the case. That even if uh, um, you know, even with these bad choices, that we would uh, be able to maintain a career, because I think always the the goal has always been to be able to have a reasonable 
career and be able to schedule your touring around the world and um, to not, you know, again, it's the global minded sort of global mindedness that enters the picture. And um, I think you can you can sustain if you're very, very lucky and the very, very lucky few are able to sustain a wonderful tour schedule where you can go and play in Australia when it's the winter in Canada, you know, and you can uh, um, and 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 that and that will sustain you uh, financially for life. However, yeah, well, you um, were very you were very outspoken about that, that Buck Cherry should be more of an international band. And a lot of, say, the, the, the quote unquote hair bands from the late 80s, they did not go over so well internationally. A lot of those bands are now stuck playing the States because they didn't build that. And so it was important to you that if this band is going to survive on a big level, that it should be in other countries where people were listening to those songs as well. That's exactly right. And we did begin with uh, quite a few international tours. We, and first show was in Japan. And uh, we played Europe, um, all of the festivals, several summers of the festival circuit there. We did South America more than uh, any other band I'd been in. And so I was hoping that that would sustain. However, um, too much time was spent in already um, conquered sort of uh, markets, you know, the Midwest, for example. And it's like farming, man. You know, if you if you keep farming the same patch of ground, your dirt's going to go bad. <laughs> so that's sort of that's sort of where it is. And uh, I don't fault them at, at, at all. You know, um, everyone's got bills to pay or what have you. But I thought, you know, we could achieve that and um, what I was looking at at the same time. And I think it would have been uh, a, a much nicer life than going back down the same hill that you just climbed in the opposite direction. That's never any fun. So um, no, I, I understand, and yeah, no, I was quite vocal about it, and I guess that can be a drag. But I think for me personally, it uh, proved to be um, fantastic uh, because I'm, you know, I don't have the stress of being, I was very worried about the trajectory at the time. And now I don't, you know, I don't really give a shit. I got other things to think about. <laughs> it's a good attitude. I have to say, though, when, when I think about Buck Cherry, there's been so many different in, 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 incarnations of the band. Uh, you know, the, no, no one who played on that original album, uh, other than Josh, is still in the band. What do you think the reason is that there's so much turnover? Well, I mean, if you look at the first iteration of the band, um, I think you'll find that there's a bit of a pattern. Um, I think the exact same thing happened to that band. And then they got, in 2005, they got all new guys, including me. And um, they did the exact same thing, man. So, you know, you don't get that many opportunities. And if you choose to do it the exact same way you fucked it up the last time, it's going to be a problem. <laughs> yeah. You, you did stay until 2013. So you made it last a while. I did my best, man. You know, I tried, but... Uh, at a certain point, I, I was making a probably making a nuisance of myself. Um, but again, man, it's uh, certain personalities. Uh, when a band is good, it's effortless. Um, that's the same for anything, a marriage or a friendship. Um, you know, you go through your hard bits and things like that, but you always recover because it's like, you know, some people so well, you don't have to try, you know, um, when you have to really try to, uh, get a vibe out of a relationship, it's not suited, um, for, uh, for, um, long term. um, you can get past it. And, and I also, I believe it's not suited to creating great music. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, uh, Music is one of those. It's one of one of the things that's sorely missing 
in my view of um, music is, um, you know, sure you can, it's very convenient to record um, from a distance on a laptop and all those things. And it's, uh, it's great to get song ideas down, but in the, in the essence of the moment, man, having five good friends in the same room playing, uh, I think there's an ethereal quality to it that um, can only be called magic, really. And I think the same holds through true for that band performing on a stage in a room full of like-minded uh, people, um, be that anywhere in the world. And, um, you know, one of the greatest aspects of um, being in a rock and roll band is doing that, writing a song and then traveling to the other side of the planet and having people recognize it. You know, that's the most gratifying aspect of it to me. Um, yeah. The money was never really a consideration. Right. Yeah. Well, it's a nice thing to have, but it's not the driving force. It is a nice thing to have and you get used to it real quick. <laughs> yeah. I can, uh, I can only imagine Jimmy. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today. I know a lot of people, uh, will enjoy hearing these stories and a lot of we're all looking forward to the future because I think uh, uh, you alluded a little bit that of, of some future musical projects and a book possibly in the works too. I don't know that I can stop, man. Uh, you know, I've tried a number of times and um, you know, the, the, uh, the act of um, sort of, you know, when an idea, sort of comes flying through the window capturing it and and recording it or at least you know getting your mind working on um that song idea is um to me the most gratifying thing in the world i mean you never know when it's going to happen and it tends to still happen to me so as long as that's happening i feel like you know i have a responsibility to it to uh to make it make it come to some sort of fruition eventually but again i'm not on anyone's schedule i'm not i don't have a manager i'm not ever gonna have one again or a, a record company or any of that stuff so i think if i were to do something it would be very very small um probably quite weird and uh a long way away <laughs> yeah well you 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 and izzy do have a lot in common uh you know, he, he puts out records every now and then if he feels like it. And so uh, maybe you have that as well. Yeah, I get it. I didn't really, I didn't really get it at first, but I didn't really get it now. so um, yeah, I think it'll be something akin to that. You know, um, I'd like to, uh, I want to explore this. I've, I've done a couple of things. I mean, I have, uh, I did a tour with the Colts. That was already, you know, several years ago. I did that for um, fun, and um, but it just lasted, you know, six weeks or so. And then I did another thing, which was really cool. I went on a cultural exchange with the U.S. State Department um, to Buenos Aires, and uh, just spoke to some kids in some universities um, with a couple of buddies of mine, and um, that was really gratifying. I really enjoyed that. So I want to explore doing some things like that, uh, maybe in Italy. I don't know anyone there and nobody really knows me. I mean, I do have some friends, uh, cool. some young guys who play and stuff, um, but I haven't really uh, tried to do anything um, musically uh, there yet. But it'll be a lot of fun, I think, you know, and uh, who knows what will happen, man, but I'm sure well I'll Okay, so kind of a story out of that. <laughs> I, you, I, I, your life is filled with them, and I'm sure there's more to come. I was saying that when we first spoke, you said, I don't really have anything to promote, but I'll still do it, and I thank you for that. When you do have something to promote, you're always welcome to come back because uh, you're a great guest, and I know people would love to hear more about uh, what's next. Oh, man, Jason, it's been an absolute absolute pleasure, I must say. I really enjoyed speaking with you, and I've done these very i really need to spend quite a bit and i would love absolutely love to come back um and maybe without with fewer technical interruptions 
Yes, maybe we'll do maybe we'll do it in in person. I got to tell you, I got a cool guest next week. You'll get a kick ass. Nasty Suicide is my guest next week. Get the fuck out of here. Week. Awesome, man. Oh, yeah. my God. Send him my love. Yeah. yeah. I know that you were tight with those guys. Oh, and so. Wonderful. I think he froze. Man. You, too. you froze, Jimmy. Yeah, man. man. All right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well. We had a few technical problems, uh, but I think we, we came through it, and I think we got the point. And I thank you all for watching. I hope you'll uh, continue to watch. Make sure you subscribe. Thank you, and we'll see you again.